Hello, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Peace Wineikism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you could also find me on theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. So today we have Betty Ann Kamanya, who is a voluntarist, anarchist, anti-war advocate. And more importantly, <laughs> the reason we're going to talk is she's a peaceful parenting, unschooling, Mama of five kids, a 32-year-old, a 30-year-old, a 27-year-old, 14-year-old, and a 13-year-old. Um, and so she's coming to us from Florida. Um, and so she unschooled her kids in the 1980s before YouTube, Wikipedia, um, Google, if you can Im- if you can imagine that, <laughs> before yes. the internet, before Skype, before, uh, you know, long distance calls were free <laughs> as they are today, right? As the era of the, um, of the landline, uh, you know, long extension cord phones, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, so she's greatly influenced by the work of John Holt. And yes. so she, uh, she used a lot of his um, uh, books and writings uh, to help her in her um, unschooling um, endeavors. So we're going to ask her all about that because I'm sure a lot of people, even today, a lot of um, a lot of mothers are having problems unschooling and homeschooling, even with all the um, information available on the internet. Um, and uh, not to mention, you know, how can a person do it um, when unschooling and homeschooling was even less popular without and doing it without the internet. It's really an amazing achievement. So, so Betty Ann, thank you for coming on the show. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so yeah, why don't you start us off with, um, uh, maybe a little bit of your background and, uh, you know, how you, how you came to the philosophy of, uh, of homeschooling and unschooling. And I, I remember you told me before that when you did it, there wasn't even the term unschooling, right? It wasn't even around. So, uh, so, so tell us a little bit about the history, how you came to learn about it. Well, we, um, were, we do attachment parenting. So we really believe in meeting our children's needs and, um, not forcing or coercing them from the time they're born. We know they're little humans. And so as they grew, um, we never had like bedtimes or they ate when hungry, they slept when tired. We always went with their unique flow. And because every child that's born is unique and different. So when it came time for school years, we knew there wasn't going to be a one size fit all. We just knew that wasn't going to be good uh, for our children because Children are just so unique. They all learn different at different times. They all have different learning styles. So it kind of just was an extension of our attachment parenting and peaceful parenting. And so if you send your child to school, you, you, you know, you're kind of forcing them to wake up at a certain time and you're forcing them to a lot of children don't want to go. They don't want to be separated from their parents at su- such a young age. And they would cry. I've seen kids cry. They don't want to go to school. And so that just, I'm like, there has to be a, a different way. So um, we decided we were going to homeschool and um, take it from there. We didn't really know what that looked like. All we had was Growing Without Schooling magazine and we had the John Holt books, which were very beneficial. You would go to your library and, you know, search for things, which there wasn't very much information back then. And so we kind of got the philosophy that just like our children learned how to nurse, to wean themselves, to crawl and then walk, to talk. We didn't teach our children those things. They, it's like children are born hungry to learn. They want to know about the world around them. And so we just kind of took that whole um, philosophy and just every stage and age, it just built from there. And so when they start being curious about letters and letter sounds and seeing words and, you know, wanting to know what they say, it's just learning is such a natural thing when it's not forced upon a child or, you know, trying to make them do things against their will. And so the main premise is, um, enriching your child's world, like enriching what they're into, cheering them on. And that's the main premise of unschooling. And so you just do it through the, the grades, what would be grade school years into the middle school years, into the high school years. And then they just leave the nest soaring because they, 
they've they've never lost their love of learning. Yeah, yeah. I, I wrote a, an article uh, uh, maybe a month ago, two months ago, called uh, "Learning and Living Are Inseparable," and and exactly what you said that um, you know the, it is impossible to live without learning something along the way, right? That's what That's true curiosity, true education is, right? Is learning. <laughs> it's not, yes. it doesn't only happen in a, you know, in a drab cinder block building <laughs> at desks. That's, yes. <laughs> right, so. As a matter of fact, learning uh, is stunted in that environment. I, I believe learning is stunted in that environment. You know, wh like when did being in a classroom become the real world? Never, <laughs> never. Like people are like, well, they're not in the real world. And I'm like, they live in the real world. They're in the real world every day. Like, I don't, I, when did being in a classroom become the real world? That, I, when did that happen? Yeah. I don't know. So, so, <laughs> so, so what were some of the things that your children as, uh, as children, young children, uh, that they were interested in when they were young? That, well, that's you interesting because it's, it's, uh, our Natalie was always very extroverted and full of energy and, um, she, loved people and so and loved numbers was so into numbers and into math and as the years went on like by the time she was in high school she actually asked me to get her a math tutor for calculus and then and she went into the mortgage industry and so she was doing very well and um she had bought her own house by 22 years old but the mortgage industry went kaput uh, as you know, like we had that big downturn. So she went into restaurant management for a while, but now she's back in the mortgage industry again. But so she was always into numbers. And so it's almost like your children are born with a bet. Like you can actually see it in them. You could see what they're drawn to, what they love. And so just, you know, if you nurture that, that it will grow, it will grow. And then, and then our daughter Carmel was always into like health and nutrition and exercising and all and skincare and as the years went on you know it was the skincare all the makeup and she went to after our homeschooling or unschooling went into um to be an esthetician but the funniest thing was our son Ben because even though we played ice hockey he was a goalie from age five until he was 17 hmm. um he loved in the kitchen mixing up chemicals kitchen chemistry he was always working with chemicals and food dye and coloring he was very artistic and he liked he, i have pictures of him at three uh doing my husband's hair my hair <laughs> he wow. just it was like him <laughs> so when, so he was about i guess he was about 15 and he said you know if i don't make the nhl which that's every little boy's dream who plays ice hockey i i guess i need a plan b and i'm like probably that's a good idea to start thinking of a plan b <laughs> and he said do you think dad would mind if I went to cosmetology school? I'm like, if that's what you want to do, <laughs> hey, we're right behind you. We cheer you oh. on. So, yeah, so I guess he was about, I guess he was probably like 16 going on 17, and he felt like he's ready to go now. And I'm like, okay, so, well, most kids – to go to cosmetology school, you're going to need either um, like a GED or, you know, what do you want to do with that? Like kids – a lot of kids take like an eight week course for the GED and he goes, well, can I just try taking it and then see what happens? I'm like, sure. So he did. He tried, he took the GED, which really they crammed like four years of high school into this test, but he did very well. You know, he got his GED and he, he was finished his cosmetology school before his buddies were even finished high school. Oh, shoot. I hear yeah. that so often from, from on the homeschooled, you know, unschooled kids. That's so awesome. <laughs> yeah. And he loves it. Loves it. As a matter of fact, he's flying to California next week for Sassoon school. And he's been to Miami for extra schooling and the New York Redken exchange. Like he has all these certifications. Like that's the great thing about unschooling. They never want to stop learning new things. Like they just keep going. And I see it with all my older kids and, and even with the two teens that were still unschooling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I follow a lot of uh, John Taylor Gatto. Do, do you follow oh, any of his stuff? Oh, love him. Yeah. Love yeah. yeah, yeah I have uh, I have the book, um, uh, Weapons of Mass Instruction. Um, I still have to get to read it, but uh, <laughs> I read a lot about him. I heard a lot of his talk uh, speeches. And uh, one thing that he says that I really love is... Um, when he said uh, genius is as common as dirt <laughs> because you know everybody is like i hope my son becomes like mozart like beethoven like you know all these geniuses but the thing is that I, the way i look at parenting and, and education is like we don't have to do much you know for like people tend to think that kids are like blank slates and we have to put all the effort to write on these blank slates what we think they should know 
<laughs> right? And it's more like they are these diverse and um, you know unique individuals that have their yes. own passions and desires. And really, what we need to do is help them with resources, but mainly just get out of their way. That's right. <laughs> like, just That's let them do what they're gonna do. <laughs> that is very true. That's right. And, and, and when they get stuck on something, they'll ask for your help. If they trust you, if you've been a trustworthy, you know, partner with them, they, they come to you when they're stuck or they need help. They, you know, it's not like, I I know, like even in the teen years, I I see a lot of the young girls feeling, um, you know, not so close to their parent because they've had all this, like almost like oppressive rules on them. And, uh, so they, they, they won't go for like help. And I'm like, like my girls, like they'll come to me and say, can you help me with this? Or can you help me get to do this thing I want to do? Or, you know what I mean? They trust you because you, you've proven yourself trustworthy. You've respected them and respected their opinions and you value, um, sometimes they might not make the decision you would, but you still have to respect them. Um, and that's when, you know, you're partnering, you're partnering, you're not like this authority over them. You're partnering with your child. And that, that goes, you really have to do that if you want unschooling to go well. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's a major, um, aspect of uh, authoritative parenting, which is the appeal to authority. Um, which is like, I am the, I am the adult. I am older, stronger, more experienced than you. Therefore you have to, you know, shut shut up and listen. And you know, (laughs) doesn't matter what you think right i'm more experienced and bigger and stronger and also that's also the argument for for spanking too right it's like it's like i get to tell you what to do and so it's it's a, it's a really an unequal situation and the same thing when you go to government school it's an unequal situation it's a, a you know there's the authority figure that hands down the information and then there's the um, the subjects <laughs> the students that receive memorize regurgitate onto a test and yeah. it's so sad because like what you said, you know, I don't view myself as an authority. I view myself as an equal, like as an advisor. Even, you know, if they want to ask me, they can ask me. As I'll give them my advice, but they don't have to take it, right? So, right. and hopefully they can see the value of, of your advice because just by, you know, if they don't follow it, then there'll be natural consequences. Not that you're going to do something to them, but that it's right. your advice is so valuable that they would want to follow it. <laughs> Right. And you give them all the information. That's, that's really important. Like communication is so important in unschooling and giving them information, like things as simple as like brushing their teeth, let's say like from a young age, we get fun flavored natural toothpaste for even before their teeth come in and just kind of get in the habit of like, you know, tickling their things and they think it's fun. So if you start when they're young, making things fun and exciting and giving them a choice, um, about it, then they're not going to buck. Like, so when they do get their teeth, you're like, um, can you have, I, like I would, we would ask our kids, can we, can we brush your teeth now? Like, is that okay? Like, cause then I think when it's like forced upon them, they're going to, they want to back away from it. So long story short, just by, you know, us having good habits, them watch, watching us, um, you know, they wanted to brush their teeth, but there's other ways. Like I know one schoolers who don't force their kids to brush their, t- their teeth and they don't want to brush them, but they give them, like healthy foods that can take tartar off and think like there's other ways like they can do coconut oil pooling, oil pooling. And there's other ways, but I have to say like, I'm really thankful all our adult children left home with no cavities. These two at 13 and 14 have cavities. So, you know, obviously, you know, it's just respecting them enough to not be forcing yourself on them. That's their body, but we give them the information too. Like, like, well, if you know, if, you don't want to brush your teeth, this is what could happen. Or, you know, if you don't want to eat these healthy foods, although we've never had restrictions on foods or anything like that. But it's funny because my children tend to gravitate towards healthier, like foods, I think that nourish their bodies well. But we always had treats around and all that. So that, there's like a whole scope of, it's it's not just unschooling, it's a whole lifestyle. Mm. Like mm-hmm. you, you wouldn't want to... Um, we don't have any restrictions as far as like um, restricting. Well, you can only eat this, this, and this at this time. So it's all it all goes hand in hand. If you want it to work well, it's really respecting them and them trusting their own body when they're hungry, what they need. Because even sugary foods, sometimes they would need that. Like before a sporting event, their body might crave sugary foods, and they're going to need that extra energy boost. Mm-hmm. So I think if we trust that, the whole thing is trusting your child. 
trusting your that unique individual child, what their body needs, they're going to crave. Mm-hmm. What when their body needs to sleep, they're going to want to sleep. So it's just really trusting your child and their unique clock and their what their body needs for nourishment. It's yeah. about trust. Yeah, I love that the, about the trust and 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 um, you know in volunteerism there's a, a principle called self ownership, <clears throat> which um, completely applies to peaceful parenting because. Um, when you recognize that you as an individual have self-ownership, you own your body, you own, you know, everything about you is yours, right? You nourish it, you take care of it, it's yours, it's nobody else's. Therefore, um, children are individuals too, right? And their yes. body is theirs. Therefore, anything yes. that would that would alter their body permanently, like circumcision, like, you know, like, you know, some some people, um, you know, pierce the ears of the, the girls, you know? Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> that's, to me... Um, self ownership violation, right? And so I um, am, and uh, you know, the circumcision thing—that's that's something that um, I kind of I kind of understood before. But uh, but you know, when I thought about it in terms of volunteerism, it just makes sense. That's like it's like it's something. It's about consent. You know, if they want to get circumcised, they're going to come to an age where they can make that decision, right? And they can choose to do that with their own body. But to do that, to to make a physical permanent alteration on someone's body. And then say that they're not going to remember it. <laughs> That's a completely ridiculous argument. It's like it's like you can cut you can cut the finger off of an infant, and they're not going to remember it. But that doesn't make it moral, <laughs> you know? Right, right. That's right. You know, Ag- agreed. So it's it's really trusting they are their own person, and and so like I I know there's some unschoolers that say. Well, we unschool everything except for we don't have any sugar in the house, so they're not allowed to have sugar. Or we unschool everything except for we have to do math workbooks. Unschooling is not going to work because if your child is sitting at the table sulking over this math workbook that you're saying you have to do that before you can get up to play, you're, they're, they're going to buck. They're not going to want – math won't be fun for them. They're not going to like numbers like they would if you would just let them naturally learn about the numbers that are always around us. All the time. There's numbers in everything we do. Math is always all around us. So I, that, that if you want unschooling to go well, it's kind of like you have to really dive in wholehearted and, and make a decision that you're going to trust that child that you're looking at. Because even somebody could tell you like, well, we do this for unschooling or we do this. But really look at your own child and go like trust them to know what their need is. So, so it will go much you, better. What would you say to somebody who said, um, "I'm going to play a little devil's advocate"? <laughs> um, you know, what if your child just wants to play video games all day, or what if they just want to play outside? Like, you're just going to let them play? <laughs> what, oh, yes. what, would, what would you say to somebody like that? Oh my goodness, I'd be like, "Do you know how much learning is involved in those video games? Uh, like, like Minecraft? There is, mm-hmm. I mean, they're actually using Minecraft in schools now because it's so educational. There's so many. They learn how to code. Mm-hmm. There's yeah. so many. Like, there's so much they can learn from that. Like, uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of the reading for some of my kids came from playing games online all the time. Um, there's this thing called Pop Tropica that my girls would have to read to get to the next level. Certain things mm-hmm. and. Um, but uh, like, and if they want to play all day, that's even better yet. I mean, even Peter Gray says play is the most powerful educational tool we have. I mean, so like when people say that, I'm like, I, I'm all about it. Like, you know, and, and if that's what they want to do, if that's what their body needs right then, if that's what they feel is going to help them get to where they want to go, I'm going to cheer them on and I'm going to bring them snacks and ask them if they need anything. I'm going to make it pleasant for them. Yeah. I'm going to be, yeah. It's like, I'm all about that. That's so beautiful. You're going to make me cry. I just, it's, it's just so, it's amazing how, how revolutionary that sounds to most people, but it's really not. <clears throat> and, and the only reason I think people bring that up is because they see in their own kids that are forced to go to these government schools and then they come home and they give them even more homework to take away more free time at home. And then when they finish all that, all they want to do is just watch TV or play video games and just get away from it all. And then so <laughs> they're like, you see, that's what they would do if we, if we they wouldn't go to public school. But I, the way I look at it is like, well, actually, they're kind of like un like deprogramming, like like, um, you know, calming down after being forced to do things against their will for like most of the day, you know, that's what they want to do. Let them do. (laughs) Yeah. And it's funny because like people who initially start unschooling really need to de-school themselves. 
that the parent really needs to de-school themselves and get out of that mindset because your child's not going to trust yet that when you say, oh, okay, you can have unlimited technology, they're going to be like, does she really mean that? So they're going to like gorge on it. They're going to be like, they're not going to be able to get enough of it because they don't know if you're going to take it away from them. Yeah, and then the exactly. parent has this power struggle because then they're like, oh no, they are, that's all they want to do. And then, so then they're like, no, no more of this, you know? And so it's like this power struggle that goes on and I, I see it happening all the time. And I'm like, well, wait, they, they kind of knew that was coming. So that's why they were gorging on it. If you really relax and de-school yourself, no kid's going to want to play video games 24 hours a day. Trust me. I have five of them. <laughs> they eventually would get, you know, there's other things they want to do. Course, there's other, yeah. I mean, there's like sports they want to play. There's ice skating they want to go. They want to meet their friends at the mall. They want to go, you know, to the zoo. They want to, you know, you're going to provide this really rich environment and make things really fun. They're going to want to go on a picnic. They're going to want to bake. They're going to want to crochet. I mean, my, my one daughter, Domenica, at, I guess she was 12, and she was crocheting all the time, and she was making these really cute scarves. And she got the idea she was going to put them on a website and make a scarf business. And so she put it on, got her own website up, was charging $5 a scarf. <laughs> and she learned a valuable lesson, though, because all these people put orders in. And now her hobby became like a business. And she felt pressure. Wait, wait, wait. wait. At, at what, age, what age did she start that business? She was about 12. Wow, that's great. Uh, you know, and she had all these orders and she fulfilled them all. But after then she stopped taking orders after a time and said, you know what? Now <laughs> crocheting is not fun anymore. It's like I have to do it. So it's not fun for me. So now she'll crochet again. But it took her like a year to get over that. Like she she was like that was very um, de like uh, demanding of her time and everything. So she so she decided when she has a hobby, she's going to keep that a hobby. But things she has wants to make a business, then she'll make it like mm -hmm. a business. But I said, you know. What you could do is take, instead of taking so many orders, you could still keep it a hobby and enjoy it, but get paid for something you love to do. Mm -hmm. so, so now she, like, it was a life lesson for her to learn because wow. she took, she took too much on, like she took too much, but it was a lesson. So, yeah, but she yeah, wanted yeah. to fulfill her obligations. And I was, I, I was really excited for her that she did do that. And, um, like right now she's at children are her passion. So at 13, she asked me to find her some volunteer jobs at local, she said, could you call some local churches or some after school programs, see if they need help? So I said, sure. So I got right on it. So she did all last year, um, she did after school care. She was helping little children learn English who their parents just spoke Spanish. Um, and then um, she was volunteering at a church nursery on Thursday mornings. And so what happened was she's like, you know what? I think I want to be a nanny because I love kids. She said, can you find me a medical CPR course? So I did that. She passed just passed that recently a couple weeks ago at 14. So now she's like medically trained with CPR. <laughs> she can use a defil def I can't say it, defilibator. De defil de de defibrillator. Yes, that. <laughs> <laughs> and her um, the instructor of the class at the Red Cross, no, the American Heart Association said, oh my goodness, she did so great. Like she was with like all these like nurses and stuff. And <laughs> it was so cool, you know? So it's like you just really help your kids get to where they want to go. And you know, so, and this is a child that never had any limits on her technology and could have played video games all the time, but trust me, they, they want to do other things. Like, <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the other thing I, I went in the, uh, joyous, was it the joyous schooling or joyous living? Oh, joy, joy, uh, joyfully rejoicing. There you go. Joyfully there. Rejoicing. That's a really great website. For yeah. Us. Really Joyce great. Federal writes beautiful. Joyce, I love her. Joyce Federal. If you want to learn a really sweet way to unschool, she's one of my unschool heroes. Joyce Federal. She writes the Joyfully Rejoicing. Oh, it's so beautiful. I was, I was reading some of the description, uh, the way she describes it. And, and she was saying the fundamental difference between, um, you know, authoritarian uh, parenting and, and unschooling is, you know, authoritarian parenting and going to government school basically focuses on um, the goal, right? It's goal oriented, right? You know, you have, you're doing this to get a job, to get a good, you know, ha to get a nice house, a nice car and all this stuff, you know, get earn a lot of money. Whereas, you know, um, 
unschooling is more about the the path, right? The means, the the you know, yeah. what do you do along the way? That's more important. It's like, are you enjoying yourself along the way? Because if you're not, then what good is the goal? <laughs> right. You, it's it's so true. It's so true. And and you know, I I never looked at like, well, what are my children going to be? Because they are right now. <laughs> That's a, isn't that a weird question? What are you children going to be? <laughs> yeah. They, well, I don't really worry about what they're going to be because they are right now. I'm going to enjoy them every step of the way, what they are right now, you right. know, because they're just really beautiful human beings right here in front of me. And I'm going to look at that right now in, in the present. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, 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 it's a way of not living in the present is focusing on the future all the time. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, they're focusing on this. What are they going to be? They're going to be that. So they're not there yet. So <laughs> yeah. it doesn't matter what they're doing now. We're focusing on that. You know, so it's, it's really. And, and, and I tell people when my brother said to me, oh, your kids are going to end up selling beads on a beach. And, and I'm like, if that's what they want to do, if that makes them happy, <laughs> I support them. If that's what they want, if that, I just, all we really want for our children is to be kind and loving, peaceful adults and, and just love what they're doing. You know, that's the important thing. You want them to just really be good human beings. You want them to, you want to fill them with like lots of encouragement, lots of love. And, um, you know, hopefully if we all peacefully parent, we're going to raise a generation of peaceful adults and then we're going to have a more peaceful world. See that? Yeah. What a revolutionary concept. Yeah. <laughs> and there's, you actually remind me of uh, this economist, uh, Jeffrey Tucker. Um, he's a voluntarist and an anarcho-capitalist. And one of his quotes about, you know, somebody asked him, like, how do you make the world a better place? How do you improve the world? And he's like, the best way you can make the world a better place, besides peaceful parenting, <laughs> you know, of course, and unschooling, is you find something that you are passionate about and interested in and skilled at, and you just do that to the best of your ability, yes. <laughs> you know, and, and if you can make a business out of it, all the better, but, yes. but that's how you make the work. Just do what you're best at and what gives you the most happiness. And, I'm, yes. I, and that will bring, that will like permeate into other people and, and make them happy. <laughs> it's like, does that, it's, it's amazing. That, it's amazing. That needs to be said. <laughs> I, it's true. But if you do what you love, you're really not working a day in your life. And I think what else is important to remember is, you know, to not get that mentality of, I have to, mm. I, like, I never look at like, Oh, I have to do these dishes or I have to do this laundry. I look like, look what I get to do for my family. <laughs> look how I get to show them how I love them. Look how I get to make this healthy meal for my children. Like it, it, instead of looking at like, I have to, mm -hmm. it, it, it's all, that whole change of thought. It like, look what I get to do. Mm -hmm. It changes everything. And I think, you know, an attitude of gratitude mm -hmm. displaces all other emotions. So yeah. I, I think that's really key to a happy, joyful, unschooling home too. Is not saying, "Oh, I have to do this," but like, look what I get to do. I know what you're going to say when I ask this question, but I still want to ask it <laughs> because I, I want you to explain it. Um, what's your um, approach to corporal punishment and spanking? Oh, I think it's horrible. I think it's like I think it shouldn't be. You're, you why why does an adult have the right to 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 hit a small child? Like I just think it's appalling. And I think, um, I mean, I'm a follower of Jesus's peaceful principles and you would never see Jesus hit a child. And so I'm so appalled that, and that's why I don't go to like, I'm not religious and I don't go to churches or whatever. I feel like I am part of the, his church, but because they teach that and I think it's so wrong. And, um, but there's a lot of things that people who say claim they're Christians do that I don't see in the Bible. Like, yeah, yeah. like the war, they think it's like war and like, no, lay down, you know, we're to like love everybody. We're not to retaliate. We're never to hurt a child. We're never to. So I don't know. So, but anyway, I, that's my philosophy. Like you, I mean, it's against the law for an adult to hit another adult. It should be against the law for an adult to hit a child. It really should. And where, do, what, what good is that? They're, they're not going to like you. They're not going to trust you. You've broken the trust with them. You've broken the relationship with them. Yeah, exactly. You, you communicate with them. Like, and you know what? Children, they don't try to do things wrong. Like if, if, if they, you know, children are so little, they're just learning. So, if, you know, if they knock over the bookcase and the books fall or they spill milk, I mean, they, they just need to be reassured and, and just help them. I, I don't know. I think children, I think sometimes parents like get mad for things that children just do because they're just children and they can't help it. They're just learning, you know, they're learning new things all the time and they're curious. And I think, and you know, my children, one thing, they never had a temper tantrum. 
They never had to, when you're really into your kids, like you can kind of read them. Like you see, are they hungry? Are they tired? Are they, you know what I mean? Like you can kind of meet their need before they even have to cry for it. Or Mm -hmm. you can tell if they're, um, like at the food store, if I see children, like the mom says, you know, no to this, no to that, put that down, stop that. Instead of being like, oh, are you hungry? Do you need something? Like mm-hmm. how different that is and how the child wouldn't have to have a temper tantrum if like the parent could see there's a need there. They're trying to, they don't know how to voice that they're having a need. So, and I, and I think parents spank for things that really they're just being children. It's, it's really quite sad. Yeah. Yeah, the the double standard that you mentioned is something I say a lot. Like you know, you you um, you hit your you hit a friend and that's assault, right? You hit your spouse is called domestic abuse. And you hit a child's called discipline, <laughs> right? It's, and, and it's legal. It's wrong, 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 wrong. I the best way to make you know break the relationship or harm the relationship is to do that. I think it's wrong, really wrong. Oh yeah, yeah, and uh, and again, you know, it's all about self ownership, and you know that your kids are individuals; they they own their bodies, and and again, like you said, they're just learning, right? So it's not like they're spiteful or malicious or doing something to intentionally anger you, or you know, you know, just uh, <laughs> like like parents tend to think like, no, he's doing that on purpose; he wants he wants to make me angry. You know, it's like, it's, it's just, it's just so sad. Yeah. And, and the other thing is most people spank, you know, they, when I talk about this to people, they, they, when they, when, you know, when they do it to their kids and, and, and they say they get insulted, they're like, no, there's a difference between spanking and abuse. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and, and it's like, it's almost like, it's like the, when I spank them, my child knows that I love them. I'm I'm spanking them because I love them, and, and I'm like, oh my god, what what kind of a schizophrenic way of looking at things can you be? You know, because first of all, the child doesn't know the difference, right? And 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 second of all, most most parents, um, when they do spank, are they like calm and rational, or are they angry and frustrated? <laughs> like right. they're not yeah. spanking when they're calm, you know. That's the other thing. I just, it's, yeah, it's like wrong. I think it really should be outlawed. I think it should be illegal just like, you know, domestic abuse, like you're saying, or you can't assault another human. Well, here's a precious child. You're so much bigger than them. Yeah, it should be, it should be illegal. I mean, I'm not illegal because I don't really believe in that either. I think why can't adults just realize it's wrong? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I think I think it's really it's really the precursor. You know, all this uh, you know type of violent, authoritative parenting and spanking, and corporal punishment is the precursor to going to government school and being a subject in a system mm-hmm. where you are not respected as an individual. You are part of the collective, and you're basically just taught to be you know cog in a wheel and just a worker drone. You know, and and not to be an individual, yeah. not to be creative and imaginative, not to be an entrepreneur, not to not to respect your own desires and passions <laughs> at all. Right. Yeah, they just want you to sit down, be quiet. And that, that's a funny thing when people always say, oh, well, how do they get socialization? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. well, how much socialization are they getting in school when they have to sit down and be quiet and not question authority? Exactly. I mean, yeah, it's – and I love that my my children, like, they're respectful, but they definitely will question um, question things. Like, if they see something not right, like, they have no trouble, even if it's an adult, saying, I don't agree with that. Like, I love that. I want them to say that they're, they're respectful. They're not saying in a mean or unkind way, but they're saying, no, that's, I don't agree with that at all. You know? Mm -hmm. So I, I love that about them (laughs) and I want them to question. Yeah. That one of the saddest things that I see is when a child and a parent brings their child into like a, some public place, like a a medical office or some, maybe, um, yeah, something like that. And then they tell the child, sit there and be quiet. And then the child does exactly what the what the parent wants. Sits there and is very quiet, very obedient until the parent comes back. And when I look at that, I'm like, how much violence and spanking must there be and shouting in the household for the child to be that obedient? Mm-hmm. Right? And it's very scary to think about that because that's not how children should be. <laughs> they shouldn't be like they're in boot camp just taking orders from like their superior. <laughs> you know? Right. Well, it's a funny thing about that. My my one daughter, when she was eight, she was getting a physical. She had to get a physical for something. I forget what it was. I guess play on a sport team or something. And the doctor said, well, I have to check here. And and, and my daughter grabbed her arm and said, no. 
<laughs> and I mean, no. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, it was so funny. I'm like, go Giovanna. Yeah, I was like, yeah, like, yeah. I was, I was like, I'm like, she said no. If she doesn't want you to touch her there, then it's no. <laughs> it's no. Uh, that's really yep. great. Really great. Yeah. So yeah, 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 like my my kids in uh, when we go into public, my um, you know, again, like like you said, I have a three year old and five year old, and they have no problem talking to adults. They really no problem. They're not afraid to. to they're like we're just walking around the park, and the, my daughter, three year old daughter, she's yelling, uh, you know, that's my brother Marcus, and I'm three years old, and I, I'm wearing a nice dress, and this is my scooter, <laughs> you know, and she's just talking to people. And I just love it. You know, she has no fear of other people, you know, no fear of adults. That. And I think that that's how kids are born. They're born without a fear of, of authority. Right. Right. And, and that's beaten into them by authoritarian parenting. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and that doesn't really go anywhere good for for life, like really for for them to be able to, like you're saying, be creative, use their gifts and talents and um, to be able to communicate what's inside them. You know, they need that. They need a, they, they need to have a voice. They need to be able to speak their mind. And we should respect that. Like, I really believe children should be respected and honored. I mean, they're like our, like our future. Like they are our future. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That really. So we need to really, you know, build them up that way and not to be so compliant or I, I don't want that. I want them. I don't want to say, oh, be careful. I want to say, be brave, be courageous. <laughs> I yeah. I, agree. I like that. Yeah. So, so, so tell me how your family, like, were you raised, uh, like, how were you raised uh, regarding unschooling or this approach or, well, or spanking? Yes. Or? I'm one of eight kids and, um, it was a completely different life. Uh, I'll, like, I won't get into any details, but I wanted my children to have the childhood I always dreamed of. Mm. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. Because it's really rough. Wow. It was very hard. It was a very hard childhood. And but. and um and what about like like when you were when you were in the process of homeschooling or unschooling them? How did your family react to that? Well, unfortunately, a lot of my siblings are teachers and went into teaching and vice principals at public schools. Wow. And they, did not, they did not like it very much at all. Wow. But ironically, my one brother, who's a vice principal at a school in Pennsylvania now, um, he started a program. He really does have a heart for kids and God bless him. I'm so glad he really does love kids. But um, he started this program for children that would end up in um, like a a youth detention type place. They, they were children at risk and children who had maybe committed some minor crimes and they would have went to like a, uh, a school where they had to live there. But my, my brother said, let me try and help these kids in a different way. And he actually asked me about the homeschooling or unschooling because he wanted to individualize curriculum to them. He thought maybe they could do better instead of feeling so lost. And um, so he really came to me years into it mm -hmm. and said, you know, how do I do that? How do I, how do I like try to make a curriculum for them individually? You know? And I said, well, look at that particular team, you know, what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? You know, that kind of thing. So, you know, tr meet them where they're at and, you know, try to get in there, like really communicate with them, really listen, listen twice as much as you're speaking to them. You'll know, you'll know like how to meet that need if you, if you do that. And it turned out to be a really successful program. Cool. for him so it, it got me like a little bit of they didn't give me such a hard time after that wow so. and, and um and when you were doing it uh the, the homeschooling and unschooling um were you in contact with other um homeschooling families were there uh, many around where you were living doing uh, it not not in the elementary years of the older three there were like people just they didn't understand it they didn't get it they there wasn't a lot around it was kind of um wondering how's this all going to work out? How's it all going to go? We really weren't sure. They didn't have any like unschooling friends or even homeschooling friends, not even uh, homeschooling friends. Wow. And so it was like, um, but we kept them involved in a lot of like community sports, like our, like our older daughters played softball, even though, you know, the community, there's a lot of community sports and uh, they met friends in the neighborhood. They could see after school and things like that. They never felt like they were 
really the only thing my girls were worried about was in high school are we going to get asked to a prom that was like the biggest (laughs) so funny well they got asked to every prom like a 20 mile radius it was so funny i they went to more proms than probably anybody who ever went to high school they were asked okay cool oh oh yeah they yeah they didn't miss out on any of that and uh (laughs) That's yeah, great. so sometimes I always say my kids were too social in some ways, you know. <laughs> but yeah, that was their main like worry. Are we going to get asked to a prom? You know. <laughs> so, wow. but yeah, yeah. That's 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 great. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm uh, constantly in contact with uh, you know a, a few homeschooling uh, and unschooling families around here, and uh, and you know we're always out and about in museums and and parks and playgrounds and you know trails and you know going on the mountain the beach and just you know in the forest and just doing stuff, and I love it. <laughs> I just love yes. letting them free play in the woods. It's like what better way to learn about stuff than like like today they. They saw, you know, a spider with like looked like eggs on it, and then they had like uh, they saw a, a cre- like a, it was like a, a fish uh, carcass, but like just the bones, and then <clears throat> so they were marveling at that. <laughs> it was <Yeah>. just wonderful. <laughs> it's great today. I mean, with now now my, my my teens, they have a ton of homeschooled and unschooled friends. Oh, cool. So they're always doing things like we, and we always have people over to our neighborhood. Like we have swim parties all the time here. And it's so wow. great in the day. Like we actually say now, like ugh, summer's here. Now everything we love to do is crowded. Like, <laughs> you know, it's like, cause we like to go to like the, in Florida, they have the water parks open all year round and stuff. So we can go in the day when nobody's there. The beaches are clear, you know, <laughs> now we avoid them on the weekends. Like the, you know, like in the winter, we avoid them like on the weekends, but now we have to, it's just so crowded. Everybody's out of school. It just really mucks things up. <laughs> like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like you want people just stay in school, stay in school. We're, yeah. we're enjoying yeah, ourselves. Like, <laughs> you're, you're, you're like on our turf now. We like it all. <laughs> You know, it's, but it's, it's like, they have, they have a lot of school friends too that they hang with. And especially on their, like my Domenico on her sports teams, like, um, a lot of her, her team buddies, they go to school. So she hangs with them at different times and too. So it's all good. Yeah. They, they can get along with anybody, my girls. And, but they're very social. Like there's, I love with these two that there is so many activities for the homeschoolers and unschoolers. So they're very involved with that too. Awesome. It's great. Yeah, you're you're very blessed to have it at this time and where, where everything's um, there's so many support groups and so many um, avenues to. Uh, it was so different back in the eighties. Oh like you goodness. were just really alone. You were really, and people didn't know what you were doing. <laughs> they were like, "Is that legal?" Is that, <laughs> that's what they would say. You can you can school your own kids. Like, and they picture you like eight in the morning till five sitting at the kitchen table. Like, no, it's not like, no, they are living and learning and learning and living all the time. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's so funny that you say, is it legal? Because that's one of the, um, one of the basic, uh, ideas of volunteerism is, is they say that a, the slave asks, is it legal, legal? And the free man asks, is it right? Right. Mm. Or, 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 or is it moral? Right. And because that's the true question. Right. It's not about laws, right. <laughs> you know. Right. Oh, I love that. I never heard that. But that's so true. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, that's, really- it's, it's yeah. Is it legal? It's like it's like all if you're just going by legality to establish your morality, um, you know, in the past, chain slavery was legal. Right. The Holocaust was legal. You know, the the uh, segregation Jim Crow laws were legal. Right. The the Stalin purge where millions of people died was legal. The, you know, Mao's, Mao's, again, purse, millions of people die. Legal, right? So legality is not absolutely not a basis for morality. It's diametrically opposed. They're polar right. opposites. Oh, right. Oh, wow. I'm just like, that's like, <laughs> <laughs> that's so true. I never thought about that, but that's so true. It is, you know? And I, and I want to tell parents who are skeptical, there's a few books that I would love for them to get, like, if they're like, how does this all work out? Like, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's this really great book. It's not big at all. It's very thin. It's by Allison McKee. It's called Homeschooling Our Children, Unschooling Ourselves. She really unschooled, but she didn't really, she wrote this a long time ago, um, probably in the 90s. And uh, it's so funny because I don't know if you can see the picture of the kids on it, but they're definitely 90s kids. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> the 90s hair doing all. But she was great. Like, I love how she did did this book. It's It's like... I don't know. It's just really well written and it's called homeschooling our children, unschooling ourselves because I know parents who they probably can't wrap their minds around 
the unschooling, mm. like how does that all work? How do they learn to read? How do they learn to write? Yeah. And they actually learn those things by doing. Mm -hmm. that, that's how we learn anything. That's how we as adults learn. And when we're interested in something and ready to learn something and want to learn something, we're going to learn it well. And it's true knowledge. It becomes true knowledge. And it's not like we're memorizing things and then regurgitate them for a test to get a grade. And um, all these outward, uh, like these outward motivators, they, they it does, it's, I don't, that's wrong too. All these gold stars and stickers and grades and even, even diplomas. I mean, really, when you think about it, like what you should do things because you want to do them, not exactly. to get an outward. Exactly. <laughs> There's a good book about that. Alfie Khan. Did you read his book, Alfie Khan, Punished by Rewards? Oh, um, I think my wife got that um, a while ago. That's a really good book. And you know what else is really important for unschooling parents? Like um, everything falls into place like with chores even. Like people say, well, how do your kids do chores or how do they? I'm like, they don't do chores. Like if they want to help me, I'm really grateful. And it's so like from the youngest age, like because you're like loving them and, and you're helping them and and you're meeting their needs. They 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 want to do that for you. They they want to help you, you know. And it's like like I used to come in the garage with the groceries, and they come they'd like jump out of the car and start helping me just bring them in, or you know, it's like really oh, sweet. So, it's like so you're beautiful. helping. I love it. Yeah, you're helping each other, you know. And then some of my children are neater than others as far as you know how I like things because I am me myself. I like things neat, but that's my issue. That's not my kids' issue. Like if they. But some of my kids are neat like me and they, they like order. And then there's others that aren't so neat. And I say to them, would you mind if I straightened up your room or, <laughs> or do you feel like doing your room? <laughs> you know, yeah, even yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. and if they say no, I'm going to respect that. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, and if they, you know what I mean? Like, and some of them that are particularly, uh, like a lot of stuff around, I'll be like, can I help you organize it? And a lot, most of the times they say yes. Mm -hmm. And that's great. I, like, I like that, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, but I'm not going to like force it or, yeah. or say, oh, well, I'll give you this if you do this or <laughs> yeah. like, I want them to do it just out of a cheerful heart. Oh, that's so beautiful. I love it. You know, that, that, that brings to mind another, another volunteer's concept, which is, um, uh, good ideas do not require force. <laughs> yes. to basically distill what you said about you know the stars and the punish and the and the rewards and punishment you know that's basically what it boils down to right good ideas do not require force and if your ideas require force then your ideas are worthless that's right that's right <laughs> which is the essence of every single law and tax you know tax that is you know by the threat of punishment <laughs> yeah All right it's it, yeah, it's, it's, it, where is that going to go? It doesn't go anywhere good. It really doesn't. So it's, it's, it's just better if people just do the right thing just because it's the right thing to do. Oh, yeah. And because they want to do the right thing. Because, because, you know, not to get any reward or accolades or anything, you know, it's just because it, it brings us joy, I think, too. When we, it makes us feel very satisfied as humans when we do something that um, benefits others or in, and, and things that we can feel great joy about, like when we feel we've done something productive and good, it, you, you, you can't put like a reward on that because it's something internal. Mm -hmm. You know, it oh, just yeah. is oh, a yeah. good feeling. It's my kids. I love they do things just because they want to and, 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 they, and it makes them inside, it makes them happy. You know. Yeah, my 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 um my kids they love to help me cook. For example, every time I'm cooking, chopping vegetables, my my daughter, three year old, she wants to peel the garlic. <laughs> you know, if I'm making guacamole, they love to stir. Like I, <clears throat> I'm taking the the avocado meat out of the avocado, and my son loves to mash it. You know, is they love to help. You know, and that's how they learn by helping. You know, <laughs> that is so true. That they learn a ton that way. And, you know, and it's a shame because if some, if, if somebody's in a rush or something, they're going to be like, no, no, I'll do it. But really, that's the best thing. Let them help when they want to, because then they continue that on. You can't one day say, oh, now you're 14. Like, can you, can you help me do this? <laughs> no, you didn't let them do it all those years. You know, they're not going to want to do it happily. Yeah, so yeah. that's great. They're, they learn so much like, like, and that a lot of the fractions that our kids know, it's because they wanted to help baking, you know, yeah. the fractions right, and right, right. You know, they, like I said, it's, they love to figure out the tip at the restaurant. 
So percents, they're like, well, do you think she should get a 15% or 20% tip? And I'm like, what do you think? And then they'll figure out the percentage. Like, so like, like I said, numbers are all around us. Math is all around us. One thing I did with our kids is I would make a math grid. Like I'd put one to 12 at the top, the multiplication sign and one to 12 on the sides. And they used to, I just would leave it out on the kitchen table. <laughs> and so that, like at first they were like, they could say were around five or six, maybe six. And they, they were curious about it. <laughs> and so they would be like, well, if I did two twos, and then they would put the four in and then they would, you know, count by threes or, you know what I mean? They were figuring it out. They wanted to know about it. They were curious about it. Mm -hmm. And so it's so funny because one thing led to another and pretty soon they were racing each other to see who could fill it in the quickest. Like, because <laughs> I put a fresh new one. I made like copies of it, you know, so I, had, I had copies and copies of it. So I would just right, put right. a fresh one every day on the kitchen table. <laughs> if they played with it, fine. If they didn't, fine. But I, I laughed when they started making it a competition between themselves. <laughs> and they, they never sat to mem they never sat to memorize you know the multiplication tables, but they did end up learning them that way, just that fun way. So you're saying that you didn't test them and then ground them or send them to detention if they didn't pass the test? <laughs> no, no, just left it out. They're very curious. They really do want to know. And and with the whole reading thing, they I get like easy readers, and uh, we'd sit on the couch and snuggle like you know each children around me and. Uh, Sometimes I would be reading and they'd be following and I would call it popcorn reading. So I would stop and whoever would pop in with the word, they like even if they had to do an inference, like infer if they didn't know the word, they would infer what should be there. And I'd be like, oh my gosh, that's right. That's great. Like, you know, it's like, so you just make it like fun for them. And before you know it, they're taking off reading. I mean, so just things like that, like, um, I'm trying to think like with uh, with reading, getting like easy readers all around. And, and they're, like I said, children are curious. And when they're ready to read, they just do it. They, they learn reading by reading, spelling by spelling. My one daughter, Giovanna, used to bring me a list of like 100 words. And she's like, Mom, I want you to give me a spelling test. And I'm like, you do? I'm like, wow. okay. Yeah, I'm like, okay. So she, she would like sit there and... and she must have a photographic memory, I'm starting to think. Because wow. in five minutes, she'd be like, I'm ready. I looked at all the words. I'm ready for my test. I'm like, <laughs> okay. Well, she would get like all 100 of them right. And I'd be like, wow. you must have a photographic memory. Cause, wow, you know, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it, children are funny. They'll surprise you when you, when you don't even expect it. Like for her to come and say, Mom, I want you to give me a spelling test. And, and she's so funny because with all her friends like on Instagram and Oh, she's always correcting their grammar. <laughs> well, I'm like, oh, well, you have to have mercy on them because they go to school, so they probably <laughs> want to learn that. I'm like, they're they're re they're a reflection like, of their education. Yeah, she's like, mom, they don't even know they're there and there. And I'm like, yeah, and I'm like, That's okay, so well, be patient, be patient with them. <laughs> so. I know it's yeah. it's really so it really it's really hilarious how how you know people who are educated in government school are so critical of homeschoolers and unschoolers yet like you said in so many ways they are because of their love of learning you know not because they're forced to but just they love to learn this stuff they they're just ec people excellent writers you know e excellent yeah. poets or essayists and I mean let me ask you with your kids uh, if do you remember like you know roughly the ages that they started to learn themselves how to how to read you well know? they were all different our son at five was asking me um like about the alphabet and the letters and what sounds they make long vowels short vowels he was very curious about all that and i'm telling you in two weeks he was like reading the encyclopedia like what? he just Seriously? he just like picked it up he just flew with it wow. and our one daughter um now she was really struggling with reading but i i found out she actually had like a um learning disability mm. um eventually uh so she the thing words were getting mixed up and she had what's called mixed dominance which oh. makes you ambidextrous huh. so sometimes it creates genius and you know the right side and the left side will like albert einstein had mixed dominance. Oh, really? Okay? okay. And, and, but sometimes it can create a lot of learning issues. And so for her to learn something, um, she needed to see it visually and hear it auditory. So, um, what well, she really struggled with the reading, but, um, I remembered she was in going into ninth grade and she was picking up the great illustrated classics, which probably would be on school terms, like a third grade, like reading level. 
and and it just clicked one day like but I didn't get like all freaked out about it or like nervous or whatever and then and then once once it all clicked it all clicked for her and she's a great reader now she's very mm-hmm. she's an avid reader she mm-hmm. loves to read all kinds of things like so and from there it was before the internet came out so she would go get library books like you know all like on Anne Frank and she wanted to know all about the Holocaust. And so once she could read, like she really ran with it. She wanted to learn a lot of things when reading became, but you know, had she been in school, they wouldn't have had the patience. They would have probably labeled her. Yeah, exactly. It would have made her feel bad about herself. Exactly. When yeah. she was ready, it all clicked. <laughs> and so that's what I'm saying. Like it could be like, so with all five kids, it was all different ages. And oh, yeah. I don't think we should be fast to be like, oh no, this isn't working. She's not reading. And she's going to, you know, she's like, you know, I'm saying ninth grade level. Like she was probably around 13 when everything clicked Okay. with the reading. Yeah. 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 So, you know, it, it could be, I don't know. I just would hate to see like, had she been in school, what could have happened with yeah. that? Oh yeah. You know, definitely. because like she would have felt really bad about herself. And, but I did end up having her, um, I took her to a psychologist to, like for an educational testing just to see what I could do to help her, mm-hmm. you know, cause I could tell she was struggling with some things and here she had this mixed dominance and it turned out to be a blessing. I went because when she went to take her state boards for, um, her career, she needed a reader it's called at her. And because it was documented that, you know, so she had access to special accommodations. So sometimes like, it's not a bad idea to go privately to somebody if you feel like your child's kind of struggling with something, you know, you can, you know, help them, you know, help them with that. Like don't, and that's what we did. And then we knew that like what we, what we could do to help her better, like, you know, and, and so there's nothing wrong with asking for outside help. If you, if, if the time comes where you're like, okay, there's, and I kind of knew there was something a matter. I should like when she was two, she was saying, mommy, come here. And she was saying, um, bus stopper, bus stopper. And then, and I'm like, I don't understand. What are you saying, honey? And then she brought me to the dust buster. So mm. even then things were just jumbled. Mm. And, um, you know, so she just needed a lot of extra like patience, a lot more love mm-hmm. and just, you know, helping her. And, and she's great now. She's soaring. That's wonderful. Is, is that, is that a form of dyslexia? It, it sort of is in a way, but it's more like a processing. Um, your your brain can't. Uh, you need like extra time to process information, mm-hmm. and and then to. Uh, I'm trying to like. It, it probably is a form of dyslexia because letters do get jumbled yeah. in the mixed dominance. Yeah. So I would say, yeah, it probably is some form. I mean, they never said that, but mm-hmm. I would. It's, it's very similar because mm-hmm. things get jumbled up. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. That's that's really great. I mean, you're right. You know, kids achieve their milestones at all all different ages. You know, and all different. and that has no bearing on their aptitude later in life at all. You know, it's like it doesn't. You know, some kids learn to walk at like six months. Some kids learn to walk at fifteen months. But does that mean that the that the uh, the six month or seven month old kid is going to be a marathon runner, and the and the fifteen month old kid is going is going to like limp? No, no. You know? <laughs> yeah, they just are all unique. They all learn at different times. And when they're ready to learn something, they do. And so that's the whole premise in unschooling. Like, look at your individual child and then just partner with them and help them get to where they want to go. Excellent. Yeah, that's really, really great. Um, so uh, before we go, can you, can you, do you have any other books that you want to um, show oh, yes. the listeners? Now, if, if somebody has older children, this is my, one of my favorites. It's called the Teenage Liberation Handbook, How to Quit School and Get a Real Life in Education. It's by Grace Llewellyn. And it's, I, I've probably bought 50 of these books. I'm, <laughs> I'm friends with Grace on Facebook. Uh. And I told her that. I should probably start getting free ones now if you buy 50 because I hand them out to every 13 year old that hates school wow, and great. the kid loves me. I don't know about the parents, <laughs> but the wow. kids love me for it. Wow, and uh, yeah. And then they work on their parents to try to get their parents to sign them out of school. Wow. It's a good, it's a good one. That's really good. Really good resources. Cool. Really good resources. And then another one is um, the uncollege alternative. I don't know if you can see that. Yes, I've, I've heard of Uncollege. Yep, Uncollege, love Uncollege because, 
you know, college is a funny thing anymore. It's you really have to weigh is it worth the investment? Yeah. Actually I wanted to ask you about that too <laughs> with your kids. Yeah, you really do because I know so many of my older kids' friends who went to college, they can't find jobs and what they went for. They're back home living with their parents. They're like thirty two, like my daughter's thirty two. Some of her guy friends are thirty two living at home. Mommy's still doing the wash. And I'm like, <laughs> No. And mass and, and massively in debt as, as, in addition. Yes. And have all this debt so they can't move out. So really, it's like I'm not a big fan of college. I mean, unless you're going for a particular thing that you know is needed. Mm. You know, like special ed is going to be needed because unfortunately so many children have autism today. One in 30 vaccinated boys is aut like autistic. It's it's so sad. It's staggering actually. Yeah. yeah. So a special ed is going to be needed and – um. You know, there, there's certain things that are going to be needed that you would need college for. But I, but all these – this whole thing with like, oh, our kids have to go to college. Like mm -hmm. it's not really worth the investment anymore. And the debt that's accrued, it's like they they, they just can't get ahead. Mm -hmm. And I don't so, – it's, like it's like a mortgage sometimes. They kinda, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. I know. And oh, you know what I'm really into about this mortgage for you young people today? I tell my kids all the time, the tiny house movement. I love oh, that. Oh, I heard of that. Oh my goodness. I just love it. I, I mean, if, if we did it all over again, I mean, my husband and I, when we started out, we were singing, even though we ain't got money, I'm so in love with you, honey. So we would buy handyman specials and flip them. We didn't know at the time it was flipping houses, but we would just buy these houses that were like a complete wreck and we would like be living in them and fixing them and popping out babies. I don't even know how. <laughs> and, all that. and it was like, so funny. I'm like, I don't know, it's, but now it's like, but it was a good investment. We made, you know, we, we, it was a good investment actually, but with the, but I love this tiny house movement because you can, the, the, you want to be mortgage free. Like the less debt you have, the more free you are. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. So we were always like, it's so, it's so odd today because my, um, the realtors will tell you, oh, you can afford this. And I always tell my kids never buy anything more than one week salary. If you buy anything more than one week salary, you are going to be house poor. You're going to not be able to live. Mm -hmm. So, but now more, they, they'll tell you, you can afford like your whole salary. And that's like, then your house poor and you can't do anything and you just can't get out of debt. Yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah. So we're like, and if you don't have the money, don't buy it, save for it. You know, that, that's all another thing that can entrap people. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's like, it's, it all goes hand in hand. Like the, the unschooling is a very free, um, it's freedom for your kids, but it's also freedom for you because you find out like what you can do without, like, what do you really need? Mm -hmm. And, and, and cause all children really need is time, T I M E mm -hmm. time and love and nurturing. That's really, they don't need a lot of stuff. Cause like everything in nature is like you, like you're saying, you went to the park, you went to the forest, you watch the ants crawl, you, <laughs> yeah. you know, you go to the creek, you see, catch fish with bread and corn on a string. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't take a lot of money. It just takes a lot of time and love. Yeah, dedication. Yeah, the unschoolers are the ones that's doing the difficult job and the kids, the parents sending their kids to government schools, they're like, they're, they're the ones treating the government school basically like a babysitter. <laughs> You're like, right. I don't have time to deal with you. I got to get to work. Just go here and I'll see you later. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, right. so it's... Uh, it, it's just great. It's really a great, I think children really thrive and blossom and there's like, it's not one size fits all. No. They're no. unique individuals. Oh yeah, definitely. That's what government is. One size fits all, you know, one law for everyone, one tax for everyone. You know, it's like, and same thing government school for everyone, you know, standard curriculum, standardized testing. Everything. It's just, yeah. it's just nauseating. Um, <clears throat> So do you have is, 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 is any other books you have there for to show or? Well, if there's any people that follow um, Jesus, this was a good one for them. Um, just his peaceful principles. It's called Christian Unschooling. And it's about his peaceful principles of how he drew pictures in the sand and, you know, told parables and very gentle. It's a very gentle book for I don't know how many of your listeners follow the Lord, but to me, it was like, it was really sweet. It's a really sweet book of gentle parenting and, and a gentle way to, uh, cause parents have this like dream in their head of what it's going to be like, but then there's like a reality, um, you know, I think, or not even dream, maybe it's a nightmare actually. They think, <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to like 
sit at the table for this many hours and I'm going to have to be like spoon feeding information into my kids or no, it's yeah, yeah. so this book like is very freeing of that. It's like, you know, no, like just be there to like help your child when they ask and, and tell a parable or, you know, write in the sand, show them pictures. It's really sweet, really sweet and gentle. Excellent. So, Beautiful. Any, uh, any websites you want to, uh, like you can send your favorite websites. Uh, my favorite websites would be Sandra Dodd, Radical Unschooling. Um, I also uh, really like Joyce Federal, Joyfully Rejoicing website. And um, what's my other favorite one? On What they should do is go on Facebook and type in unschooling in the search. There's so many unschooling. Um, I'm trying to think who else I love. Um, and, and you also follow her, Dana Martin and stuff. Right? Oh, yeah, Dana Martin. She's a good one. Yeah, she's, she does the peaceful parenting and, you know, no forcing or coercing. And, yeah, so you, she, that's another good one. Can you um, uh, elaborate a little bit on the difference between the approach of Dana Martin and uh, Sandra Dodd? Well, um, Sandra is... Um, her kids are all grown now, her unschoolers. And so she's been like a pioneer too. And uh, she has a lot of really, it's very thought provoking. It's real, it is radical unschooling. It is a radical unschooling. And, um, but she can get um, people like think it can be hard. She can be harsh, mm -hmm. but it's only because she's not being harsh. She's really getting you to think why, you know, re words really matter. Mm -hmm. And to really, uh, but people like look at that as like harsh. Dane is like softer and like approach is more um, gentle. But I know Sandra's doing it like I, to me, it's for really it's really benefiting the children. Like how she like gets the parents to really think about what they're saying. It really benefits their kids. Okay. So, but it's like but but like but they they actually like parents feel like they're being like uh, how do I want to say? Well, well they're 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 being challenged in their thoughts and sometimes like. People don't like that. It's 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 like abrasive sometimes if if they don't really want to hear that, you know. But she it really benefits the children. What she's what she's saying is really good for kids. Like I think, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but but Jenna's just uh, Dana is just more gentle with her approach to helping, you know, the unschooling. Mm -hmm. That would be the difference. <laughs> cool. Okay. No, I just wanted to just wanted to uh, clarify that because you know I did um, interview uh, Dana Martin in the past, uh, and she's a really wonderful, amazing woman. Uh, very, you know, like you said, very gentle, sweet, kind-hearted. Um, and uh, and one of her things is, you know, one of the things she says I remember is kindness is revolutionary. I'm like, isn't that an amazing thing? How can kindness be revolutionary? Like, is that does that really need to be said? <laughs> you know, it's just. Oh, a, it's uh, isn't that something I know? And and I always say that kindness matters. Yeah, kindness matters. It does. And but to think that it's revolutionary, I mean, where where where, where has our society went to that <laughs> yeah. that's revolutionary? I mean, that should be like in like in us, you know. <laughs> oh yeah. But that's why like unschooling can create those like we're leaving that legacy for our kids, and then hopefully their kids and their kids' kids. Like we're gonna leave a legacy of kindness. Yeah. Yeah, that's about it. It's it's about you know creating a, a more peaceful world um, by educating the neck or like you know raising moral empathetic yes. people, peaceful people to yes. populate and and hopefully you know, I, I I heard it uh, mentioned by another friend of mine who's also uh, unschooling. He's like it's like a a soft form of eugenics <laughs> because we're <laughs> we're raising by changing the in order to change the world we're raising peaceful moral and empathetic people right yes <laughs> not through yes. <laughs> not through anything harsh or violent but we're out you know we're attempting, attempting to outbreed the violent people basically <laughs> amen to that amen you know and love is our resistance yeah. love is our resistance you know it's like i i don't love does conquer all mm -hmm. i think it will in the end and and it will yeah beautiful love it i <laughs> love the message beautiful conversation um betty ann thank you very much for coming on thank you for having me i appreciate it so um so this is a uh, well. If anybody wants to donate um, to the show, uh, be more than welcome. We, uh, we accept Bitcoin, uh, PayPal, and um, any other form of value. If you want to send gold and silver through the mail, good luck. But I, <laughs> we'll find a way. If you really want to send it, 
um but yeah any form of uh donation monetary uh support would be much appreciated because uh you know i'm uh i do this as a labor of love and uh it's nice uh, to get some support for encouragement, right? We all need some encouragement. <laughs> Although I really enjoy, you know, putting this content out there. So thank you very much, Betty Ann, uh, for the wonderful conversation. So this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.